Someone says, you need to get this guy on the podcast. He in the past has robbed banks and he got out of prison and he has a crazy life story. I put cotton in my jawline or in my bone structure to change the my face. I did more time than anybody could imagine. For me, doing time is easier than being out here on this camera right now. With her, she wanted the money. She wanted the fast life. Obviously, to rob a bank, you need to be you need to be smart. So I want to know, was there a specific technique? I'd make them believe we're going to do a bank here, but really we're doing it down there. How much did you make on your biggest bank rob? You have all this cash. So obviously, you have to find a way to launder the money. If you knew you would never get caught, would you do it again? You're listening to the X Podcast. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the X Podcast. I'm your host, Alessia. Every single Monday before the episode starts, be sure to subscribe to my channel, like, follow, subscribe, comment. Today, we have a very, very interesting guest who I'm so excited to share their story with you guys. I have a lot to learn, and I feel like growing up with two brothers and a dad who all, we've, all we would ever do is watch drug movies and... Um, bank robber movies like Oceans, Money He's like this was my upbringing, okay? With two brothers, this is what I loved. So this story in particular is very interesting to me. And I'm so, so, so happy that I have Leslie here today. Leslie. Hello. <laughs> Are you uh, happy to be here or nervous? Yes, I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm uh, excited <laughs> to be here. Is this your first time on camera? or This is my first time uh, on uh, any kind of podcast or <laughs> internet or whatever. But, so do you want to kind of like give people a little bit of a just rundown about your life? Okay. Uh, I loved training since a very young age and I loved like sports. And uh, I was the kind of person that never felt like he fit in kind of thing. I was very smart, good in school always could wing the exam the study the night before and pass but i hated school wow i liked it's I li always the people who hated school who were the best at it like yeah, it's and, so and annoying yeah but it, it, it was it's a curse too because you take it for granted and the person who actually studies really really hard and stays persistent is the one that completes and probably gets that nice cushy career <laughs> i never got <laughs> it's actually so true now that you mention it like I feel like the people who are, like are suck in school, they almost have like more to prove and they work so hard so they end up succeeding normally. It's like the troublemakers or Well, like... the the, tor the tortoise does win the race usually. Yeah. You know, the the rabbit didn't win it. Yeah. He wins so... it in, in the in the short term, but in the long term the tortoise wins because he's consistent. He takes it step by step. True. He's got that patience. So, I was actually out for dinner and my interviews and my guest now, I feel like I leave it up in the air. God chooses my guest. And this one just landed on me because I was out for dinner, which Massimo is actually right here to our left. Um, I was out for dinner and I saw Massimo and we actually, like I knew I knew his cousin in high school and we just got to talking. And then he ends up FaceTiming someone and then someone says, you need to get this guy on the podcast. He in the past- I hope I don't disappoint you. No, you won't, you won't. <laughs> he in the past has robbed banks. And he got out of prison and he has a crazy life story. And I'm just like, oh, my God, what is his name? How do I get a hold of him? This is like literally a dream for me to have you on here Thank today. Thank you so much. You're, you're making me blush. No, no, no. Truthfully. So I have so many questions. Should we just dive right in? Dive right in. <laughs> so what made you want to start robbing banks? I think it found me. I didn't find that. Uh, I was involved with a lot of heavy criminals in the 90s. Uh, I was a guy who was training in the gym, and I was the young guy, and they saw I had a lot of craziness, but a lot of smarts in me. I was I was very, very smart and very crazy. Like, I was willing to take risks that other people can't. Okay. You know, and they saw that, so I started out with them. But eventually, I met some guys that said... You know, it's bad karma to deal drugs and stuff like that. So he goes, I had to please cut my friend off. I was, So I, I had a heart. No matter what I did in my life, I always had a heart. So when I heard somebody and they're speaking from the heart, I listened. So they said, here, we're going to have a new career for you. So I started off as a driver. I would drive a guy and he would rob the bank. 
And uh, I was a very good driver, and I loved driving cars fast. Like, I mean, uh, when I was a teenager at 16, I was already juggling my license, you know, to, so I can keep my demerit points because I was always speeding. I loved it. I should have been a race car driver. Okay. You know, and, and when I... So wait, well, how did it happen, though? They came up These here. older guys that I met, uh, first of all, in the gym, they were heavy criminals. Some of them are dead today. Some of them are doing life. Some of them are uh, still out there, whatever. That's why I don't want to mention anybody's name. Yeah, no, and you shouldn't. But... Uh, I, I I met some uh, a pretty good uh, bank robbing gang, of uh, of Irish guys uh, from the from the West End, and they, they they said they're looking for somebody like me, because they said I'm solid and everything, so I had a good reputation on the did street. Did you have to Did you have to pass some kind of like driving test? No, they already heard about me. Like I mean, people came to me to ask me for things because I was just the guy with all the connections. You were that guy. I was that young guy that everybody that I got all the connections at a young age, because I was just already so involved at a young age, even though I was still registered at the university. They said, you know, this guy's so clean cut, like nobody would guess, you know, who, what I was doing and, uh, you know, who I was with. Okay. So it was like I, 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 I fell under the radar until I went to jail the first time. Okay, you know? so you, uh, a bunch of guys, they come up to you and they're like, you're going to drive the car. You're going to drive the car. We get together, eat a pizza car. together, talk about it. They did the, the, At that time, they were scoping out the jobs before we did them. They said, okay. we're not going to hurt anybody. Nobody's getting tied up. We're in and out. We're doing like 30, 40 second jobs. You know, it's a fast so grab, robbing, whatever we get. So robbing a bank happens in 30 to 40 seconds. If a good bank robber that always gets away is not greedy and he's usually in and out within 40 seconds. From and door to door, he's out in 40 seconds and ideally... Within 45 seconds, you're already out of that area into a hot car. We're getting ready at a kilometer away to do a switch. And So you need switches usually. And the plan is being made. Do you ever plan for, okay, what if something goes on? What if there's another security or, or something happens? Do you I didn't care. Yet? I didn't have any fear. So, I mean, even security guards, I'd walk into the, into, the, into the bank when I was the doorman. Like, I wasn't, okay, the driver anymore. I was the guy going in. I would grab them right away. I'll grab the, guy, the security guard. I'll take his CB, which has a 911 panic button. I'd smash it. After that, everybody complies. They just see this guy's serious. You know what I mean? Most of the time, it's control. When they see you know what you're doing, you don't need to violent. You don't need to be violent. You need to be assertive. Assertive takes control of the situation because people see they're just here for the money. Nobody's getting hurt. I'm not smacking anybody, but the guy's serious, and you can't fool around with him. Did, were you guys like, did you have weapons on you? Yeah, we had guns. And you guys were wearing masks. Uh, I, I, sometimes when I was working with the crew, sometimes I would have a mask. But uh, usually, when I did them on my own in those days, because they're it was in the Frisco 90s, right? In the nineties, there was Frisco Bay cameras and stuff like that. So sometimes <laughs> I put cotton in my jawline or in my bone structure to change the my face, you know. And I'd wear sunglasses and a turtleneck, even if it was summer, you know. And I'd have a change of clothes and a switch cars down the block or very close by. So whenever I planned out a job, I always had a very good escape route. You know, and the, so it was, I was able to to get out, get in That's and out. Crazy. But actually, the first bank I did on my own, I didn't even get the money because they 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 closed the bank. So I had to run in, and some woman was smashing the car on Henry Barossa Street, going, "There's a bank robbery practice." So the cops came into the parking lot, but they, I guess they knew at this time already, or you know, like don't fuck with this guy because I mean I was a pretty big guy. So I mean, uh, the cops tried to say freeze and that I slid over their hood when I ran through the parking lot. I was very agile, even though I was a big guy. I jumped over the fence, did a, like a, a handstand, a somersault over the fence, and got into a, a getaway car and I get away. And then but I robbed it the but... next day, oh, and I got si and I got sixteen thousand. Oh my god! Okay. <laughs> and then I robbed it again the week later okay. and got like thirty five thousand. Okay, wait, wait, because wait. Because it wait. was a good escape route. Like when I saw a good escape route, I said, "It doesn't matter what's going on in here. You know, it's it's how fast can you get out of that area?" Okay, wait. Let's back up a little bit because I know record, so nobody <laughs> knew who the hell this guy is. You know, he's just some. Oh my god! Okay, wait. But you said you started as the driver. Look, I started. Because really I had money, but when I fell in love with a woman who was addicted to drugs, that's why I really stopped dealing the heroin and everything. I fell in love with a woman who was, who was addicted to heroin. Her daughter was very young at the time. Were you I, ever addicted to drugs? 
only the last time I was living on the run from my charges before I, I did my eight years on the last charge. Okay, okay. And uh, I quit a cold meth- turkey 100%, never did methadone. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, I quit. Okay, so when And you- I went through major withdrawal. Like, I mean, I didn't sleep for three weeks. Crazy. I'm, I'm probably like a one, like I, I think that guy, Anthony Bourdain, who oh, took yeah. his life, I he know. was a heroin addict. He quit cold turkey. There's like one out of 10,000 that can do that. And I physically was able to do it, but it was hell. But I did it. I received the full karma of what I felt I deserved. I felt I deserved that because it's a very, very bad drug. Very bad drug. It ruins lives. I, 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 I I don't do crime anymore, not because you could do time. I did more time than anybody could imagine. For me, doing time is easier than being out here on this camera right now. Because I'm the guy who kept his mouth shut and did all this time. So for me, wow. I can do jail. It's hard for me out here. I'm, I'm working honest jobs, hard labor, yeah. and stuff like that now with a bad record. But this is what it is, you know, yeah. and I accept it. Yeah, okay, but, so uh, let's, let's back up a little bit. So you went from being the driver to um, learning, I guess, the ropes through the people you were with and then doing your own jobs. Were, were they ever like, uh, who do you think you are doing your jobs alone? Like, was it kind of like mafia well, where like you, well, you weren't no, they, able... They, they would say like, don't rob any in this area because then you're going to bring heat to this kind of area. Okay. So, I mean, it, it was a little bit kind of territorial. Nobody can tell you not to. Like, you weren't going and telling them, I'm going to rob this bank. No, because you don't really want anybody to know what you're doing. But once it's done, they're going to hear about it. And then they're like, was it Leslie? Yeah. But I mean, in in those days, I mean, a lot of the time they didn't care because, you know, you rent the gun off somebody and if you don't use it, you can just pay less money than owning it. Yeah. So, I mean, I had all those connections. Yeah. So there's obviously, truthfully, there's there's a bunch of things that you could do that are illegal. Some that are, you know, one is selling drugs. One is... Fucking human trafficking women. There's a bunch, okay? There's things going on there's, today that I can never even imagine disgusting. me doing ever. It's disgusting. and for it's sure. and, and I don't care about illegal and legal. I care about immoral and moral. Okay. And for me, Robbing drug dealing and, and pimping and all that shit is garbage. Yeah. Garbage. And I'm sorry. I'm not trying to judge people, but I'm, I'm sorry. For sure. It, do unto others as you want done to you. Yeah. You don't want your daughter or your sister you being pimped. So then don't do it to people. Yeah. That's it. So, I robbed a lot of other things besides banks. You what know did what you I mean? start by robbing? Uh, well, when I was when I was really young, mm-hmm. uh, I was still in uh, Sijep at the time. I had uh, uh, some members of my family that wanted to get together. We wanted to make a little crew kind of thing. And there was a guy that uh, he, he worked uh, like... I'll say he worked like a Canada Post kind of job or whatever like that, but he was really a big drug dealer, and he raped some woman that my friend knew. So we were, I didn't go there for the money. They told me, just bust the door down. They said it was a big door, and he was like with one of those panic bars and all that stuff like that, but I booted it down uh, in the backyard. They went in. They beat the shit out of the guy. I don't know if they got the money because I never got paid on this job. Okay. Honestly, I went. I ran out the back alley, and they ran in through the front, and we had a, a car waiting uh, up up the street. Now, uh, this guy was a bad guy, and that was the first score I really did. That, that was, And I was like 17, 18. Okay, so you didn't start with like gas stations no, and like no, no. you went straight to banks, honestly. Well, that's the guys that were taught me how to do them, you know? But, yeah. Uh, and what, like, what made you switch from being the driver? Because I'm trying to think about me. Like, if I, I feel like it's, it's less bad being the driver than being the guy who goes in. The, what honestly, the, what, st- what, what led me to keep, start robbing banks even on my own is because the guys had, we made a lot of money. We didn't need to make a lot, but I had a girlfriend that was doing five grams of heroin a day. She's dead now. She committed suicide. I'm I brought so up her daughter since, it's okay. Uh, she's, she's doing very well today, the daughter, and we're like b- best friends. But, uh. I, I saw her already at a very age crying at the door because her mother was in the, in the in the bathroom. She didn't know if she was ODing. This little girl knew everything at a very, very young age. She's a very aware child. And uh, I would say the two of us together went through hell because she loved her and I loved her. And there was nothing we can do to stop her. I mean, she would do anything to get her drugs. And, and I just couldn't stand seeing her sick. So I, I started robbing banks on my own while my friends, went, let's say, went up north and took a vacation. So I didn't take the vacation. So I actually taught myself how to rob a bank on my own. So you were. I went from driver to being on my own. Okay, so when you were robbing banks, a your, leap. your motive behind it was to get money to get her her heroin. 
I would say mostly yes, because I was a guy that was not very materialistic. I like training. I like the lifestyle, eating out at restaurants and having just a nice car and yeah. not having to go to work. So I would say for me, it was I, like, I did it for lifestyle. When I started going too far and started doing banks on my own, everything, it was more because if I robbed, say, a bank once a week or once every two weeks, I would have never got caught. I mean, I got away with it for like three years, robbing them like every day, doing one sometimes. And I would do like four days straight and then stop. Wow. You know, for a couple of days. And I didn't need to. But with her, she wanted the money. She wanted the fast life. Uh, she wanted she wanted everything. She wanted everything, and I gave her everything. She was older than me. Wow. So, she was actually so probably men? the... She was more corrupted than me. <laughs> <laughs> she was controlling you. <laughs> I look at it now, and yeah. 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 I feel like it's crazy when you really think about it, because men really do so much for women and i know I think and women are, women are so uh, uh, afraid go, these wait, days of, the, of, the, the of saying men are chauvinistic and sexist but i'm telling you if it was the other way around we would take it like you go out to work you were the buddy we'll stay at open <laughs> yeah. not have to risk our lives and our ass getting shot yeah yeah yeah, yeah you know yeah. but i risked my ass getting shot For and sure. shooting at meanwhile she was like <laughs> planning everything she didn't care she, as long as she got her drugs and i'm sorry to say that because they, they, i, I want to believe that there was love in her but that addiction satan had a really 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 bad. Yeah. I mean, she could have just done her methadone and not done heroin, but it didn't matter. She would sell the methadone to get heroin. Right. Like, there, if you if you look, there's nobody out there with like a five gram a day habit. I mean, this woman could do more drugs than five people can in a group. That's crazy. She, it was crazy how much she could do. I, I couldn't believe it. That's I was only 20 years old. She was 32. Oh my god. She and was a lot older. And than how me. did you guys meet? We met because I got arrested uh, because my friend robbed the biggest jewelry store uh, heist in Canada at the time. And they got like $3.4 million. Now, they got away with their jewelry, but they brought heat onto me. And I got busted going to pay off his bills on the street at a motel. They caught me with like five quarters of coke and 12 grams of weed. I got bail right away, and I was fighting that charge for two years to get a suspended sentence. But uh, that brought the heat on me, and I said, okay, that's it. I'm not dealing blow anymore, and I went into the heroin business. And I met her because she had a friend that was in Donnacone at the time, and I was the mother was like 80 or 90 years old, and she would go visit her son in Donnacone and bring him the drugs. I mean, this mother was like 80, 90 years old, but when people are hooked on heroin and her son's hooked on heroin, they get it to them. Yeah. So don't think that, you know, you see some poor old little almost, lady. I think it's she almost, was bringing it in. Right. <laughs> I think it's almost worse to stop cold turkey when you're doing heroin now. You can't stop cold turkey. Is, like, like, you see movies it's, it's where... Like you almost want to give it to them because it's worse. If you to love just, somebody, you will not be able to see them go sick. You will not. Your heart's going to melt. I mean, nobody wants to see the person they love puking and, 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 and convulsing all over the floor and hallucinating. But also, at the same time, you're feeding somebody a drug where they're not getting better. Well, like don't give them a... a lot to get high. Just give them enough <laughs> to get well. I mean, that was no. like the, probably the justification at that time. You know, like I, I, I was a naive guy. I went to private school for boys. I, I didn't know sometimes the total effects of everything I was doing. Right. I was just able to do it and get away with it. Right. But okay, so... you can't get away with it because God sees everything. So you pay for it in karma yeah. you pay for it in, in in spades yeah okay so i'm gonna back up because we're kind of going all over the place you're giving yes you're giving but, away this is, so much. but at least we're speaking truthful here we are we are and i love everything that you're speaking about and i love how authentic you are i only want authentic people on my podcast and you are so authentic and i really appreciate you doing this interview i know it's not easy the last time you were on a camera Th was this, probably this a makes me more nervous than anything i've done in my life I've never <laughs> more really than had a surveillance viewers. camera I didn't care. I had the cops uh, surveilling me when I was with my co accused on jobs. We were under 10 months major crimes unit investigation. They had GPSs under my stairs that as soon as I'd walk up the stairs of the place, there'd be 10, 10 uh, counter surveillance autos following us all day. So we couldn't rob banks anymore. So we started robbing like restaurants and bars at night and everything. Oh my God. Okay, well, wait. Let's like, back I mean, up. We, we hit everything that was not nailed down to the ground. Like I would take out Instabank machines oh out of the God. ground wait, because wait, wait, I was wait, wait. strong. Up, I was able up. to kick them out of the wall. Back up, back up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you switch from dry. You're the driver, and then you you learn the kind of ropes, and then you start robbing banks. Obviously, to rob a bank, you need to be you need to be smart. So to get away with it, to get away with it, you are definitely a smart man to be robbing banks. I want to know: was there a specific technique? In I would say clever because intelligent would be to see the big picture. There is karma to all this because yeah, I, no, I, I want to sure, say but... something right here, right now that you're never going to hear a bank robber, ex bank robber, talk about. If you have faith in God, 
then why do you need to do crime? You're telling the universe that I'm not getting enough of what I want and I'm going to go get it. Who's speaking there? The ego. Yeah. So you're yeah. actually not living in faith. You're living in fear. Yeah. And this is where I had to analyze not only addiction, but the ego in myself and mm -hmm. heal myself. Because for an English guy in Quebec doing federal time, there's no help for us. I did all my time. I always did two thirds. And even on the last sentence, they kept me in a half wheels to my three thirds. Insane. I never got any help. I, I never got therapy. They never offered it. They'd always say too much violence, too much violence, because right away, bank robbery is violent by nature, especially mm -hmm. if you have a gun. Yeah. So what was your what was your technique like before you were going to rob a bank? Like walk us through that slowly, slowly. Like well, let's say let's say I was going to rob a bank. I, I would take a, 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 you know, a car that I had. I used to I, I'd buy like three cars cash analyze, in a month. Like you, I owned cars and I just put them in everybody else's name. I never really owned much because I, I didn't want anybody to know I really existed. So I thank God I had uh, friends around me that I could put the, the cars in their names so I could buy three cars cash and then I would drive around, look at a bank, I'd look at the escape routes and uh, see, you know, how it's functioning and, uh, you know, that I would know, is it tills, is it drawers? If it's drawers, there's usually three to $4,000 per drawer. But if there's a central island where they slide the card, there could be a lot more. And if there's an, a booth where the deposits go in, then there could be a lot because people are depositing money and at lunchtime and at closing time, they empty out those boxes. So how long would you analyze a bank before you would you would uh, go and rob it? Ideally, I would watch them for about four to five days before I would do one in the beginning. But okay. then I got so crazy, I was robbing banks sometimes one in a day. So I would just check it out in the, in the, the night before or the, the the day before, look for a nice escape route and I just go in and whatever I get, I get. And do you think if someone were to want to rob a bank now, it would be as easy as when you did it? There's so much cameras out there. There's so many people with cell phones now. I mean, in the 90s, there wasn't that much internet or cell phones. I mean, right. you had a little more time. Today, the banks, everybody's on credit card and plastic. The bank doesn't have a lot of float on the floor. But if, if, if you're lucky and there's somebody depositing massive amounts of money, which is insured by the bank, then yeah. you'd have to do a lot more casing now. How much did you make on your biggest bank rob? On my biggest score or my biggest bank rob? Your biggest? What do my you biggest mean? score was $127,000 in three hours of work. Three hours of work. What do yeah, you mean by that? You were in the I bank? never, I know this was a nighttime job and my friend that we had to go through a cinder block and metal a wall and, and get into the place. And I was in the, the parking lot freezing in a, in a ghetto, in a, in a little car that we were going to use there. It was not in my name. And I just made a little meltdown hole where I can see because the cops were doing their rounds every hour. So we had a communicators and while he was working, I had to get him a, an eight pound ax and a sledgehammer to get through the spot. Somebody gave us a tip, but there was a bad tip because they said there was only 50 grand there and it was somewhere easy to g grab, but it wasn't. It was locked up really, really deep. And the guy, we were able to get it after about two and a half, three hours of work. Wow. You know, he got it finally. And I was mad in the beginning because when we went to the place and the money wasn't there, I walked in and I, I smashed the window and came in and he, we, we disarmed the alarm. He, he was able to disarm the alarm. And I saw an Instabank machine, so I booted it out of the wall. I picked it up and I threw it into the trunk. I drove two blocks, took a sledgehammer, smashed the casing around it. There's a little lock box in it with a dial. You smash the dial off, you put a pin in the middle, and you hit the middle with a hammer, and then the door opens. And I got 12 Gs. So then he got jealous that I was able to get something out of a place that was a bad tip. And he says, I know where the money's at. It's chained up, and it looks too secure to be what it is. It, it looked more like a safe that was... You know, I don't want to get into details because we never went down on this, but after two and a half hours of work, you've got $127,000 out, out of the thing. And how does it work when you're no doing... No guns, no violence, no nothing. Crazy. And all insured money. And how does it work when you're doing a job with a bunch of people? Do you guys split it all down... All down the middle. If I'm working with a partner, it's 50-50, no matter how uh, implicated you what are. What if you're the driver? It doesn't matter. If I'm the driver or you're the guy going in, if we're doing it together, we're 50-50. Has anyone ever, like, fucked you over after a job and said, sorry, you're not getting, like, 50% of the... Nobody ever fucked me over. They were too scared. <laughs> well, it's not that I would not accept the money. The deal was made. And back then, I'm just saying in the 90s, people had more honor. Right, like that's to, true. Look, uh, everybody's t today, they're going to say, oh, these guys are criminals. They have these criminal values. They're not rats. I'm not a rat because I believe in not jumping over somebody else's shoulder to face consequence that I need to take an accountability for what I did. And that's something of a problem today. People have apathy 
That's one of our biggest problems in this world. Apathy. It's not my problem. Or I don't take accountability yeah, for like my victim actions. Mentality. Like I knew I was going to do time. And I said, well, at least I got the gym because I love the gym. So I, at least I'll be okay inside. And I was the young guy when everybody else was older than me. I, I was in there with a whole bunch of bikers when I was like in Cownsville in 1998. Was there a thrill to uh, robbing a bank? There's a thrill to getting away with it. Yes. So when you were robbing banks. While you're in the, while you're doing it, you're so focused in the moment, it's almost like tunnel vision. You have to have enough awareness around you to be sensing everything. So actually, if you don't have a sixth sense, I would say you can't get away with it no matter how smart you are. You're not solving, you're not gonna get away with 50 banks by just being a very smart guy. You gotta have intuition. Your yeah. gut feeling, like I had a gut feeling I was under surveillance a couple of times and I said, okay, abort. You know, or we had aerial surveillance and I go by the Dorval Airport in the car and go at like 150, break the, the ground surveillance. And they can't, th at that time, they weren't allowed to fly over with the helicopter over the airport. So I would lose them that way. And I'd make them believe we're going to do a bank here, but really we're doing it down there. You know, so I mean, I was able to, they, they, the, the, the police, I got acquitted of 42 charges in a major crimes unit investigation. And the, the cops, the detective lost his job. He got demoted because we got acquitted of every charge. Had my cold cues not pled guilty to the last charge because they had no evidence on me. I was never caught in the car, you know, and if he didn't take that deal, I would have got acquitted and the cops got so mad because they said, this guy knows counter surveillance. This guy was, uh, was deking us under 24 hour surveillance. So this guy put so much money on busting us and all they got was one charge, wow. you know, Why? under 10 months of, of major, major investigation. Yeah. And I knew they were investigating us. I was crazy. Uh, I gotta say that, uh, I regained my sanity. I, I'm, I was happy. I went to jail on that one. Bec Why did you choose? to rob banks, like of all things to do. It's just another stepping stone into my criminal, uh, you know, uh, ledger. Because I remember when I was speaking to you, you were saying, um, I don't care to fuck over like the government because they're already corrupt. It's hard to say these things, you know, but I mean, honestly, uh, I'm sure a lot of people go into whatever profession they are with the best of intentions, but there's so much puppet masters at the top. I mean, I I'm a guy who, who they, anybody who had the same charge as me, they did a lot less time in jail. They got a therapy. They got a bail to a therapy. They did a bit of time and then they got a therapy. They never tried to help me all along the way. So, I mean, maybe I got a little bit of chip on my shoulder all about that. But at the end of the day, I got God on my side. Mm -hmm. You know, and I made it through and I'm alive today. And, and, and you're thank out. God, thank God uh, I'm al I've am been outside now for almost four and a half years. This is a record Amazing. for me. Amazing. You know. I, I, I would say I'm a guy who got very institutionalized. And now I'm learning how to live outside and... It's very hard for me out here. I can't imagine. I always. I just... don't want to shit talk the government no, because no, they no. do help people. I mean, there, sure. are, there are. Look, I, I'm. I'm uh, the reason why I got six years. I could have got two years for an attempted bank, but when when the cops told me that my ex girlfriend at the time took my gun and did a hold up on a gas station, which I didn't even know about, she took my gun and she held up a gas station, and. They said they were going to give her four years. And I said, she's going to lose the daughter to the DPG. And I didn't want the daughter. Even though the mother was a, a heroin addict, mm -hmm. she was still a decent mother. She put the food on the table. We drove the kid to school. We gave her parties and, and birthdays and everything. We were still doing the family thing. Right. You know, I played catch with her. I did her math for her. We did homework together. And I, did, I, I said, I'll take six years. I pled guilty on uh, to four banks that they never, I would have got acquitted of on my first charge. They only got me on conspiracy to rob a bank. That would have been two years. And possession of a three fifty seven Magnum loaded. You know, that, wow. and that would have been two years because I had no record. It literally says so much about you that you went down for someone else. But she else. never came to visit me. My stepdaughter had to get a signature from her mother just to come visit me when she was 16, just to, uh, in jail. My ex left me. And how went long off with another guy while I was in jail. That's how long I, were how, I, was, I got six years my six first time. Six years. I did five years, three months, 22 days inside on my first sentence. Wow. Inside. With, like you got to do your dead time before yeah. they give you the deal and I had to back then like today you can't just take time for somebody you know back then you were able to because they wanted me yeah, more than her they don't want to put a woman away there's not a lot of women prisons I'm gonna say women got it good they got it good I uh, I, I will definitely agree with you Another... look at Carla Homoka she got nine <laughs> years Bernardo's still doing life you know what I mean yes. and then when she gave the videos over for her deal uh, she she was totally off and I'm not saying she don't deserve it uh, you know okay whatever yeah. maybe she changed maybe she found God I'm not there to judge but I'm just saying 
from the videos, it looked like Bernardo wasn't such the bad guy as, right. you know. Uh, yeah, okay. I my, shouldn't say these names anyways. None of my business. Um, you know, let God sort them all out. <laughs> my next question is, um, obviously, it's one thing to rob banks and get money, but another question I have is, obviously, the, well, <laughs> first of all, you have all this cash and, like, how are you, how are you living without? Because obviously you have to find a way to launder the money. What were you doing? You don't need to launder it in the nineties. It was much better. Not everybody had credit cards. I could go and buy three cars cash in a month. You throw the cash on the table, money talks. That's cash true. is king in the nineties. Those true. were the days. I wish it went back to those days. <laughs> everybody today is plastic. At least when I went to a restaurant, <laughs> everyone is plastic. No, but when when <laughs> I when I when I yeah, it's plastic. It's fake. It's like even a credit card. It's fake. You don't you don't have that money. They're lending you the money with a high interest rate. So you can put yourself in debt and, and owe your ass to the company. That's what it is. It's not means you're rich. You know, everybody today is driving a Mercedes. In the 80s and 90s, if you had a Mercedes, you owned it. That means you must have a million-dollar house to back that up. That's true. You know, today, everybody's driving Mercedes. So you it's like never... driving a Lada right. or a so, Toyota. So you... Um, it doesn't mean anything. So, okay, but I'm sure there was still some kind of laundering going on. How were you filtering some kind of money? Here. Through friends. Mostly through friends. Through friends? Yeah. Like they I had the friends that whatever I wanted to buy would go buy it. They'd get a, somebody to sign it over to that. I, I never really put anything in my name. I, I had three. I had a loft and I had an apartment and another apartment. And nothing was in my name. Okay, so you didn't like I wander didn't through like casinos or do any of that stuff. Yeah, we live in, you know, the now. And things can never go back the way they were. And I made amends and peace with everything I've done in my life. and. Mm -hmm. I, Honestly, my soul is pretty cleansed to everything. No, I can I can tell you're a very honorable man. Um, but just by speaking the of... 90s were the days. People <laughs> were real. People looked at each other. They talked to each other. Now everybody's texting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, wait. They're telling you what they are or what they are, and then you find out they're not. <laughs> okay, you know? Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on. We're going to back it up. So when you did launder money, it was through either casinos, through friends. I had the contacts to do whatever I wanted to do. If I gave a small percentage of the money over, it would already be legal. It didn't matter. None of that was even a worry because cash was king. I mean, if you had money, you could do anything you want. And I wanted a car. I buy it. So you know? what were you buying when you were making all this money? Besides, like, helping your uh, your girlfriend? Eating out at restaurants, uh, maybe buying a little bit of jewelry and stuff like that. I spent it mostly on the girlfriend. I, honest to God, I wasn't a very materialistic person. I loved the gym, so I put most of my money in my body. I didn't get to take much vacations because I always ran some business or had something to do in Montreal, so I never got to travel. And did you ever watch people get caught and go to prison? Yeah. And were you ever scared that they would out you? I knew I was going to go to jail one day. Okay, that was my next question. I was going to ask you. I knew it. I didn't you care. Were ever, if you knew you would get caught. If I knew I'd get caught, at least I had the gym. I love training every day. That's why I, I spun that whole wheel and didn't want to work a job because I like training twice a day and that's what I love to do. If I believed in myself mm -hmm. properly and I wasn't such a damaged soul at the time, I would have stepped on stage and been a, a competitive bodybuilder or a world strongman. I was very strong. And you'd be training people. And training people and doing something I love. It, yeah, honest to God, yeah. I, I, I look, I, you can't say you regret it because it makes you who you are today. Yes, yes. But if I, could, if I had a rewind button... I, I'd rather take it all back, honest to God, because, I mean, I put my mother through hell and stress and my family, you know, and uh, the girlfriend, I feel like a lot. Look, my principles are my principles. I've never cheated on a girlfriend in my life. I hold that principle. I'm sure they maybe cheated on me, but I can't do that to somebody because I know how much it hurts when you yeah. love somebody. You can't imagine them sleeping with somebody else. It'll break your heart. I was very sensitive on the inside, yeah. so I couldn't do these things. I saw everybody else do them. But it didn't mean I was going to become like them. Yeah. So I I'm the guy who kind of kept his soul in a soulless world. I'm sorry to say that's how no, it felt. No, no. I, I really, like, honestly, I'm a very big, like, universe person, energy, spiritual. I really feel that from you, that you're a very honorable man. And, like, you will do. Sorry. I was very intuitive at a young age, I realized. I fell in love with a woman. And I was at the time, I was in private school for boys. And I, I fell in love with a woman when I went to Dawson. And I looked her in the eyes and I said, the only thing that would hurt me is if I found out you cheated on me. And when I looked in her eyes, I saw for a moment she couldn't look me in the eyes. And I said, no. And she says, I'm sorry. And we broke off. And she tried to get back together with me after, but I could never look at her the same because mm -hmm. I couldn't do that to her. 
Like, I could do a lot of crazy shit. But I just couldn't do that to somebody I loved, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that broke my heart. And uh, I guess that just made me train harder and maybe uh, it put me at a bit of a, a, ba a worse path. Mm -hmm. You know, like I say to myself, if this didn't happen, if that didn't happen, would it have been different? Maybe. I don't know. But ultimately, inevitably, everything happens that's meant to happen yeah. in your life. I, I like, look, I didn't know that there's going to be a podcast today for me. Uh, I, that you were gonna, I was gonna. I've been you. trying to get you on. I've been. Trying. I didn't even know. I know. Aaron, our my our mutual friend, there just you know came out of the woodwork and and said, if no called from Florida and said, I hear I got something for you to do. Yeah. And I have to say yes. When you were robbing banks, you all you did you ever hit a vault or never? I never got into a vault. Okay. No, because we were told from a, a very early time. I mean, we were we were watching the guys like like stopwatch gang and these kind of guys that said we have sixty seconds. Like that was the the the, the, time, the, mark. the time mark that you can't play in there more than sixty seconds. Even though uh, one of my partners, my ex partners, uh, he was able to hit the manager coming out of the vault before the bank opened. And he got like 240000 out of the bank, but he did it with somebody that was just no good driver and they had a taxi waiting and they he ended up getting caught. So I said, like I said, getaway is everything. If you don't got the getaway, it doesn't matter what you do in the place, you're going to get caught. Mm -hmm. You know, like, Would you say the hardest part is driving off? No, because everything is already planned before you do it. So it's just about how comfortable you are in, uh, you know, in that kind of moment. You got to have experience. This is not a. This is not for the faint of heart. And if you're nervous, people can sense it. Mm -hmm. Like when you're calm and collected, everything works out smooth. But if you come in there like a ball of fire, angry and aggressive, everything goes wrong. I know a guy who robbed the bank with one of the guys I knew. The first time he went into the bank, he jumped over the counter, the gun went off and killed somebody. He did life for that. He never got away with one job. His first job, he got life. Just to tell you that it wow. does happen. The guy yeah. went into a bank. He never even pulled out the gun. It was on his side. He probably didn't have the safety on. Maybe he didn't know how to use it. I don't know what. But when he jumped over the counter, the gun went off and it fired and hit somebody and killed him and he got life. No. Yeah. So, I mean, you got to know what you're doing. Like, I mean... Yeah. And like, oh, so you basically like just like drive by it, take a look, see like how it's. Well, yeah, set but don't up. come in too close. You don't want to be seen on camera. They have it all on camera. Everything is recorded. <laughs> Excuse wow. me. So I mean, you you got to do your surveillance without being seen. Was there ever something the way binoculars are good? You know, like. Mm -hmm. So there was never anyone in on it in the banks that were that were helping you steal the money. Maybe when I was working with the crew, but uh, not that they ever told me. Okay. Not that they ever told me. Maybe once they had a teller, uh, you know, that would she was get, in make on it. sure that there was more money on the floor that day. Because we did hit a couple banks that it just seemed there was too much there. Like I'm saying, like, who the hell keeps that kind of money on the floor? How much is was normally in the cash register? Normally in the 90s, you can get like like twelve to 16 to 20,000, depending on how many tills there are, depending on what. But I and mean, 20, I. 20,000 back then is like. A lot more money than a today. A lot more like, money yeah. than today. Like today, 20,000 back then could buy you five cars. What's right. twenty thousand? Could buy one car today. Not, Not even. even. <laughs> maybe, maybe a shitty Hyundai. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. But not with the tax. So I mean, with the tax, you won't even have enough. So yeah. I don't. Know. And they're gonna ask you, how do you get the line of credit, or where are you get <laughs> yeah. the money? No, no. Today, a lot of this shit doesn't work today. <laughs> it's so true. That's why I, I'm nostalgic. I like the music from the 80s and 90s. And You're a classic at this yeah, point. Yeah, I know I'm a dinosaur because I don't <laughs> think there's anybody like me out there anymore. Um, I was going to ask you, um, after, like, I'm sure you watched a couple of movies that, you know, they're robbing banks. Do you feel like because you've robbed banks, you feel like it, it's portrayed differently in movies than what actually goes I, on? I, I know what the real is in the movie and I see what the Hollywood is in the, in the movie. And a lot of these movies are Hollywood. Like the movie Heat was a little more on the ball. These guys were pro, they were planned out, they execute. But usually people that are doing trucks only do trucks. People that, let's say in the movie Heat, when they did that truck in the beginning, mm -hmm. they would only do trucks. Right. To them, to go in to rob a bank after, they wouldn't do that. Like, I know a guy, he robs trucks, but he doesn't do it violently. He's very, very smart. This guy this guy got away with it a lot, a lot of times. You mean trucks, like trucks with money? Armored or trucks, trucks full items? of money. Yeah. 
Right, when they're transferring the money, you mean. I'll just say there's a hypothetical situation of where they were able to scope out the bank truck. First of all, you got to know, are they depositing? Are they withdrawing uh, the, 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 the truck? You have to know the route. So these people have all that taken care of. Now, let's say the, the night before the guards go in, because back then some trucks would have three guys, some would have two guys. Right. Let's say the two guys go into Costco, whatever the rest of the, the place is. These guys would drill holes in the floor of the outside entrance of Costco. So these guys didn't use guns. They would take metal poles the day of the robbery. They would wait for the guards to go in. They'd have communicators. They'd throw the metal poles down, lock everybody and the Costco, uh, the, the guard guys in the, the establishment. So you're not doing a holdup. They come out with a thermal fusion torch. They'd cut the hinges of the armored truck and grab five to ten million dollars. And they drive away in a, in a hot vehicle and then do a switch. And they do it without violence. And they'd be getting ten million dollars. Fifteen million dollars. And they would wait for the good truck, the one that's really loaded with money. And this guy never did a lot of time because even when they would catch him on conspiracy, it's not an armed robbery. You're not holding anybody up. It's a and e You're breaking and entering an armored truck. Crazy. They were very, very smart. Some people were very, very smart. I said, man, some of these guys, people say, oh, criminals are stupid. Look, we all know we're playing a risk game. There's a gamble. Every time you roll the dice, there's always a chance something goes wrong. But that's pretty smart. Yeah. You never see that in the movie, though. I never saw that one in the movies. They don't want to give That's any... how you know... Uh, they don't want to give anyone... That's how you know I know any... the real deals. Because right? in the movies, the guy's always got an M16, and, <laughs> and, he's, and he's firing in the crowd, and... You don't need to do that. This is some you don't need to do that. These are retards. This is prison break shit. This is yeah. prison break shit. Like finding another way. Yeah, to Yeah, but like... you know how this guy learned? This guy learned because he was tried as an adult for a bank robbery that he did once in his life. And he, they sent him to a maximum. And it was very hard for a guy who was not under 18 at the time to do time in the old pen, let's say. The guy was in the St. Vincent de Paul. It was closed down. It was inhumane. It's worse. Donnacona and Archambault were the maxes after this place. So this guy studied and studied and learned how to do trucks. And this guy is very, very, very smart man. But I have very a smart man, nonviolent. I have a question because I like I truly believe to do any of this, you have to have intuition, you have to be smart. Like Beyond isn't smart. it so much easier to just figure out a way to make money legally? Because like No. No? No, no, because you when I, there's there's enough people in control of money and the flow of money that you're always gonna be working with unless you're an inventor. If you invent something and you market yourself, okay, you could be Bill Gates, you know, or, or uh, uh, what's his name there from Apple? What's his name? But the like dead just, guy. I don't mean I don't just. No. <laughs> um, no, no. Um, you're talking about Jobs, Steve uh, Jobs. Steve Jobs. Yeah, if you're one of these guys, I mean, then you're a real brainiac. That's great. But I mean, for most of the people out there, they don't have 160 IQ. You know, right. like they're going to work their way up through shitty jobs. People are going to take advantage of them and not pay them what they're worth. And even the guy who can work harder than everybody today, there's just so much demand for employment or whatever. Somebody's going to always undervalue your mm -hmm. your abilities. Like I felt, honestly, like aside from banks, some of the other things I did, I was a one of a kind because I never got caught and I was always able to get the job done. And I was underpaid because there was always somebody middling my contracts and they would grab the biggest piece of the pie. You know, because I was young, they would take advantage of that. But it's me making, you know, the... It's you putting your life on... It's me putting my life on the line. Every time I went in to, let, let, let's say, uh, burn down a building or do whatever I had to do, it's me putting my life on the line. I'm taking all the risk and I'm getting the smallest portion of the pie. Right. So for, and like can... other people say, wow, that's so much money. No, it's not that much money right. because you know how much planning and, and, and recon I had to do to get this done without getting seen on camera for and sure. get it done. For you know, sure. I, when I had to burn down places, I had to know, am I using methyl alcohol? Do I have to make it look like it's not arson? The people wanted to collect insurance. Uh, I had to I had to think out everything. What kind of propellant am I using? What kind of accelerant? Oh, crazy. You know, I can't just use gasoline or the insurance is not going to cover it. I just... So I had to make it look like methyl alcohol is wood alcohol. So when you have a floor that's wood, every floor has methyl alcohol. It's wood alcohol. So when they do an arson test, they don't know where, where the fire started. They just know there must be an accelerant, but they can't prove it. So I had to do all these things. And I felt I was really undervalued. For sure. But knowing that you are the the kind of person who gets the job done, couldn't you be like, well, I'm only going to do this if I make this amount of money? 
I don't know, but I was hooked like up. When I, worked, talent, when I worked, if you're the talent and you get the job done, couldn't it didn't you be matter. Like it this? didn't matter. I worked with some very, very violent crews, and these guys were older than me, and they had a better name on top of the ladder from me. So right. I couldn't go to the boss and say, "Can you give me a raise?" Right. I couldn't even ask. You know, they would ask, and then he'd say, "Okay, here's a bit more money." Right, right, right. Like right. I wasn't allowed to get to the top. So in then, those days. That's why I went off and I created my own business. That's what I was going to say. Better well, off when just... I sold heroin, I worked for me. You know, I'd pick up off who I needed to pick up. I had the contacts, you know. But when I had problems and people wanted to take me out of a territory, I had to be the soldier and go out there in war. Mm -hmm. I was a one-man army, you know. All these people that have crews and they say they're this guy and made guy and everything. But it was me and the people I was working with that were out there, you know. Doing the labor. Doing, no, doing the soldier work too. You know, like... The serious work, the dangerous work, you know? Oh so, God, I mean, that's, that's why I got out of that, too. It's like I went into this business to have an easier lifestyle, but it didn't wasn't easy after that's a while. That's why I'm saying that don't you think in the end it's easier to make money legally than illegally with everything you have to deal with? I feel like it's so much harder to be illegal. Well, then get my story out there and make it into a movie, but that's the only chance for me. Otherwise, Let's I'm go. just going to be working jobs for the rest of my life with my record. But I heard I mean, that... I could do security. I, I, I can't even get a BSP license because of my criminal record. And I have all the contacts to work at Cafe Bon Terras or wherever I want to work, but they won't hire me because I need a BSP license. But isn't there a kind of program that after you come out of prison, they want you to kind of like... Yeah, they want you to be a flag man. They want you to, to, to wave the flags around construction zones and stuff like that and take a course for it. I don't want to do that. Right. I don't like construction. I like destruction. I don't want to see buildings go up. I want to see nature come You want back. to burn them down? I'm kidding. I don't want to say I want to burn them down, but I like nature. I like nature. I like the fields. I like the country. I don't want to see skyscrapers. I don't want to see pavement anymore. But what about, what about your, your passion, which is fitness? I love it. I so then, training. why don't you why don't you do that? I don't know how to market. I don't know how to use a computer, and I'm not willing to learn. You don't need learn. a computer. <laughs> Just start. You, the the personal have... trainers I know, they all tell me they go, "You're a hidden treasure. If you were on uh, on the internet right now, you could be charging 120, 160 an hour." I yeah. said, "Show me." I said, I, I just don't want to learn computers. I don't I don't like them. But even if you don't start by learning, I like computers... people. I like talking to people. I don't like. I wanna. I don't wanna text and. I want to see you. I want to talk to you. I want to know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't want to I don't want to hear about you. I want to know you. And I don't want to know about you. Guys, I don't even care about your past. Guys, he meets me and he goes, "Oh, wow, you're skinnier person." <laughs> I didn't mean skinnier, it's slimmer. I, I bet that nice way. I, I gotta oh, watch how like, I talk. Yep, the camera adds ten pounds. That's for sure. I, I guess I, I don't have the uh, <laughs> the ability to how to give how to a woman to give a woman a compliment. But I'm giving you a compliment. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, but well, I don't think you're skinny. <laughs> you don't I, think I, I'm skinny? You're, you're slim. I say slim. There's a nice okay. word. Skinny seems seems kind of like so, on the polar right. Right. In know? a perfect world. You would love to train people, so I like I like training people. Yeah. I think that or that's I like your counseling passion. people too. I, I I helped a lot of people get off drugs. I think that's I your... feel that, that I feel like a, a life coach or you know guidance because I've been through hell and back. So this is your that calling. person going through hell right now, I know what you're going through. This is your calling, Leslie. This is your calling. Huh. You went through. If God all this... wills it, God wills it. I can't push it, and I'm not going to take a course. And I don't need a PhD in, in no. how to how to work and counsel no. people because I've done it firsthand. But that's what I'm saying. I think everything you've been through in your life has brought you to this moment, so that you are ready to be able to train people, be a life coach. I feel like I was ready a long time ago. What are you waiting for? Let's go. I'm waiting for the universe. No, no, the universe will. Help you out, but you still. Well, it's helping me here today, so let's yes. see. So obviously something's happening that I couldn't but, do for myself. But I still think God will be there for you, and God will guide you, and the universe will make it happen for you. But you also still have to like kind of start. And I feel like because it's your passion, it's gonna come so naturally and easy to you. So I think honestly, like even if you're like afraid of computers and all that stuff, you don't even have to start. I'm not with that, afraid but, of computers. I just no, but like it, I see the evil in them. I, I know Satan's got his tentacles in a lot of them. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he has his tentacles in in a lot of uh, society now. But I'm saying that let's this say, is the world we live in. But let's say even if you do, you know, through meeting people, like you start, you're at the gym, you train, you love training. What if you just like started with getting three clients? And then from there, word That's of perfect. I don't want more than that. But even that word. I don't of... want to work a lot. But I want word to, of mouth. I want to. I want to enjoy what I do, 
and do quality of what I do. I don't want to multitask. Okay. I don't like multitasking. But you're literally I like doing one thing at a time with perfect quality. But Leslie, you're in there. You're in you're already in the you're you're in fitness, you're training. So you're literally that's where your clients are. You don't need to go and like start uh, and be on the computers. You're literally there. Your clients are there. You well, just have to go for it. I'm I'm ready to go for it. <laughs> I'm going to be your coach. Thank you. You're the life coach. You could be my, you could be my manager. <laughs> Or my agent. <laughs> if you knew you would never get caught, would you do it again? If, if I knew what? If you knew that you would never get caught robbing banks, would you do it again? I think if people are living in real delusion if you think you'll never get caught. <laughs> well, there's always a chance. But if you knew for a fact... Are you a gambler or you're not a gambler? If you're a gambler, you'll take that chance. If you're not a gambler, you won't take that chance. I mean, it's either in your nature or it's not. You can't go to bank robbing 101 and, and do it. Because me, I think the first time I did it, I had a little bit of butterflies in my stomach. But as soon as I opened the door, I was it was a natural thing. And my my girlfriend at the time said, wow, she goes, you're a natural. She goes, you're just like, not everybody could do what you do. It's just I'm that kind of guy that can walk through. A, like if I saw you in a, in a fire in a building, I'm not going to have to wear a helmet and a, and a, and a asbestos suit or whatever. You're I'm going to go in right with my flesh and risk it and save you because I'm that guy that will do it. I'm right. just that guy. And I don't have to say I'm that guy. I've done it, and uh, that's who I am. I I'll risk it all because I'm not really afraid of mortality because I believe in God. Mm-hmm. I know that he allows everything to be. He's performed enough miracles, and I've performed enough miracles through him, through me, in this life to know that he exists. I feel like all the experiences and things you've been through really, like, taught you so much. It increases your faith rather than decrease your faith. And brought you closer to God, which I really respect. Well, I was an altar boy from the 6 years old to 12 years old at a Polish church in Point St. Charles. But, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, uh, the religion, just I fell asleep. Honest to God, my mother had to pump me full of coffee because it was all in Polish and I would just go to sleep and I had to ring the bells when he would lift up the host. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, uh, Were you, my, my, my walk was my, uh, my testimony. Were you ever praying to God when you, every time you did, um, you robbed a bank? Were you like, thank God, thank God I didn't get caught? Thank God I didn't hurt anybody. Okay. Thank God I didn't have to hurt anybody. Not that I get away. I didn't give a shit. I, I knew I would get away. That wasn't even the problem. I was like, please, I don't want to have to hurt have anybody. Have you ever hurt anyone? In one 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 job, uh, I hurt somebody. I gave them three warnings. I told the person, you got to let it go. You got to let go. Or you're going to get hurt. I didn't want to shoot him because there was witnesses. And uh, I saw a kid in the store. We were grabbing a safe out of a shopping center. And I had to take the back of the gun. I hit the guy in the head, in the back of the neck, and blood started spurting everywhere. But at least I didn't open fire in the place. Did he die? No, I don't think he died. But there was helicopters looking for me that night. Thank God I had two cars waiting and to do switches. It and was pretty bad. I felt bad for the guy, but he, the guy didn't want to listen. He was a big dude. He was a big dude. Mm-hmm. And he just didn't want to. He, he grabbed my hoodie, and he was wrapping it, like, around the, uh, the um, uh, you know, those shopping carriages in the mm-hmm. store. And uh, I got the safe, and he caught the play, and he tried to block me off. And I told him, I said, please, don't. Don't be a hero here. Don't. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I warned him. I warned him, and I warned him. And I had to give him a good shot to the neck. And, uh, so you would say, like... I didn't want to have to hurt him, but I had to hurt him. I had to hurt him, or I'm going to get caught. And I'm sorry. Right. Buddy, I warned you three times. Yeah. You're lucky I don't open fire and kneecap you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like... Okay, you're a hero. I, you're not really being a hero. The money's insured. I didn't hurt nobody. I didn't tie nobody up. I didn't scare anybody. I just said, I didn't even pull out the gun until until he grabbed me. You know what I mean? I just went to the lady like that. She opened up the safe. I grabbed all the money, and I'm going. And that's it. And then he caught the play, and he wanted to play hero. Well, sometimes there's a consequence. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes you just got the wrong guy who's not going to give up. Me, if I get chased by the cops and I'm in involved in an AR, I'm not pulling over. I'll drive against traffic. I'll do whatever I can do. There's no stopping you will not catch me, and nor have they ever caught me, in the commission of a crime. It's not going to happen. When I say no, the answer is no. So when you're planning your route, do you have like... I got A's and B's and C's. You got A's, B's and C's. I got A's, B's and C's, and I even got D's. Like, I mean, I'll go right up the sidewalk. I'll go through the yards. I don't care. God. I don't care. When I want to get away, I'm getting away. Tunnel vision. But I don't want to have to ever do that. It's a lot of stress on the body and the mind. For sure. You know what I mean? And I and I do feel bad about it sometimes in the end. But there was a part of me, like, 
guess I used to be crazy. I don't know. A little bit of crazy. But not. You know, yes, but no. Yeah. I get that vibe from <laughs> you. Know, you know, yes, but no. I'm like, okay, okay. Um, wow. What I think they said I'm bipolar. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't realize. <laughs> kidding, kidding. I've been eating a lot of these candies. <laughs> Your sugar today. levels right now are going up. Spiking. Yeah. Plus the energy drink. Yeah. Um, so for anybody listening right now, what would you take what would you say is your big like your biggest takeaway from this that somebody could learn even if they've never robbed banks before but just like you know don't, don't commit crime but whatever you do in life don't care about the money do it because you love doing it. Love have passion behind what you do. So whatever you do, you'll never regret it. It doesn't matter about the money. The money will either come or it won't. But money means nothing at the end of the day because if you don't have health freedom and your 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 dignity then what do you really have you have nothing like i mean oh you want to go and be a prostitute and make all kinds of money and i'm gonna pay for my school and i'm gonna get educated one day listen that fucking story doesn't work most of those women go get hooked on drugs you know and they're, they're they're controlled and the money's taken by these crack dealing pimps that don't give a shit about them and it's a sick world and uh, I'm sorry, but the police don't do their job. And they're probably taking, they're on the take, you know, because I just see today, look, in the 90s, if you were selling heroin, you could probably last about two years before they even know who you are, even if you're giving out an alias. Today, if you're out there dealing and you haven't got caught and you're dealing more near, I guarantee you, 90% chance you're probably no good. You're a rat. You're working for the cops. I know guys out there that got caught. They're out there dealing and, and they're dealing death. They're getting paid by the police from your tax dollars, and they're out there committing crime and getting away with it every time as long as they give up somebody else. So for me, I had to give up everything because it's just a dirty game that I don't want to play. And anymore. you had the option to rat out people in order to, to, yeah, to have that, a... Yeah, but what? Sell my soul? What did Jesus say to the devil when he was doing his 40 days and 40 nights? Why would I gain the riches of the world and perish my soul? That's the first thing that comes to my mind. Why would I gain the riches of the world and perish my soul? You want to be a rat? You want to be an informant? To me, you already gave up your soul. You might think, oh, I'm a citizen and I'm doing the right thing. If you're doing the right thing, take the dealer out yourself. Take it by your own hands. You want to shoot him? You want to give him redemption? You want to do something? Do it. But putting the guy in jail, he's just, somebody's going to take his place. Or he, he, you're going to walk and, and you keep on dealing. You didn't take accountability for what you did. So don't tell me you're doing a public service announcement. Don't. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. When you get caught and you did what you did and nobody put a gun to your head, you take accountability for your actions. Okay? Yeah. And that's it. And then you went to prison. How was that? It was hard. I would say my first time because, I mean, I, I really loved my ex and she never came to visit me. But uh, I did it. I, I adopted pretty well. I mean, I was already known by a lot of guys that were older than me and that. So, I mean, I was able to eat a bit better in the Federals and that. I was, you know, living okay. And, and there was a gym and I was able to do the time, but it was long. Like, I would say that when you're doing big Federal sentences, the first two years is the hardest because you're giving up your life outside and it's escaping your mind. You're saying, my life is basically over that I knew. And then it gets easy. And then the last two years... It starts, it starts slowing down again because now you're looking at the end. So I would say the best thing is when you see those movies of the guy marking the wall with the days he did, that's crazy. You can't do that. you got to get rid of the watch, get rid of the calendar one day at a time, and you're going to get through your time. And that's how it worked for me. I didn't live in time anymore. I just lived in the, in the eternal now. And, and then what, all of a sudden, bang, eight years goes by. Or so. <laughs> what would you say was the hardest thing about prison? Rules. Man's rules. You know, seeing the injustice in the justice system, seeing all the guards that claim that we're the bad guys and they're the ones bringing the drugs in. Hypocrisy. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I just find hypocrisy is one of the worst. Mm -hmm. and there are some good people working in that field, but I'm saying that most of them, they're not good people. They're not. It's not the guy who wears the badge that's a good person. It's the guy who's behind that badge. Is that guy going to step out of that alter ego that he thinks he's living in and he identifies with. How many movies today we see with dirty cops? Let me tell you something. Whether or not the movies are true or not, it's a testimony to this story of a truth that was told about something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it's not what the person's wearing that makes the man who they are or the woman who they are. It's who are they inside. Do they step up to the plate when crunch time comes mm -hmm. or do they not? You had a lot of people in jail say, oh, I'm a tough guy, this and that. 
But when they're alone, all of a sudden they're not so tough. Mm-hmm. You know? I, I walk into a cell and uh, I'm not a guy who's going to get into a ring and box people for points. But uh, I've had four guys jump me in a cell and I'm the guy coming out. And they're the guys with knives and I'm just with my bare hands because I just have that that will. And and honestly, if I had a choice and I didn't believe in God, I just said, okay, well, then take me out. Because, I mean, I know I have, like, so many more years to do in jail. So you're like, oh, fuck, put me out of my misery. Right, 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 right. <laughs> um, but, no, I believed in God and I prayed a lot. And uh, honest to God, I was able to handle time. And guys that were doing a lot of time say, how do you handle it so easily? Yeah, I've actually been, I actually ordered a Bible recently. Um, I've been getting more and more in tune with God, and I have a. I actually have a question. Read the for Gospels. You. Understand the Gospels. Um, Don't literally read them. Read between the lines the message. So that's the thing. I feel like sometimes I'm reading something, and I'm like, I don't understand, and I have to read it a couple sometimes times. Sometimes you got to experience it, and then it's gonna hit you. Yeah, but sometimes I read it, and I'm like, what is the lesson here? And I'll reread it, and I'll be like, oh, okay, it's crazy how things that were written so long, long ago, ago still pertain to now. Pertain to now. And it's, more than ever. You, you said that God has done so much for you, and there's so many miracles that came out of this, so I would like for you to like speak about a couple. There was a guy who was in Bordeaux, and there was a Colombian guy, and he couldn't speak English, and he couldn't speak French, and they thought he was some kind of cartel leader. Now, that day, I was praying upstairs i was already like in my third year of dead time uh, fighting a trial uh, okay. on my on my charge and i said to god i said hey, you know why don't you just take me out of here i said i'm tired of all this you know i don't even feel like go to train today but then something told me no go to the gym so one thing i learned in jail that even when you have a walkman i mean it sounds old nobody's got a walkman anymore but i mean that's all i had i only wear one ear i always do because when you're in jail you want to keep your senses alert mm-hmm. to what's going on around you if something pops off so anyways Everybody's on the phone downstairs talking to their wives, their girlfriends, and the gym is downstairs, and I'm training a bit. And I notice a lot of people looking at me. And I say, they can't be looking at me. They're on the phone with their wives or whatever. And I look behind me, and there's a guy with his eyes rolled back in his head, and he's having a heart attack. And everybody's frozen like a deer in the headlights. Now, protocol in the jail is they would have to lock us all up, put us in our cells, then get a stretcher, and four guards would have to carry him out. And by that time, and by the, the guy's dead. So I just grabbed the guy, picked him up on my shoulder, ran him right up straight up the stairs to the infirmary. Thank God there was a, 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 he was Polish or Bulgarian guard, and I was there for a long time, and even the guards respected how quiet I was, that I'm mm-hmm. not a shit disturber, that I calmed down a couple of uh, episodes where there would have been a full-blown riot, mm-hmm. and they didn't, the people, the, the inmates they really respected you. me, because they said, this guy's been here the longest, he's been here four years in prevention, not even a murder trial takes that long. So I booted the gates where the, where the gates are, and the guy right away buzzed me open, and he ran with me to the infirmary, and then I kicked the infirmary door, and I put, we put the guy down on the bed, and they jumped him back to life. And he, he came back to life, and uh, the next day, uh, the sergeant that was in charge of the sector of Sea Wing in Bordeaux goes to me, he goes, man, he goes, uh, it's really nice what you did. He goes, you saved me a lot of paperwork, and that guy wanted, I'm going to let him come in and thank you, but I have to put him in another wing with a panic button in his room because he's got a heart condition. He had a, he had a heart attack. So the Colombian guy says, he goes, uh, wh- what can I do for you? He goes, if it wasn't for you, I would never see my wife and my four kids in Colombia again. And I said, I don't want anything from you. I just did it because I'm able to do it. You know. Mm-hmm. I said, thank God for it. And the guy was innocent. The guy got acquitted. He, he was a diplomat. He was actually like a, a diplomat. And his papers were wow. not in order. And he thought he was a, they thought he was some kind of cartel leader. You know, there, there's mistakes in the system. Yeah. This guy was innocent. You know, and thank God. Thank God you were there. Thank God to... I was there that day. There was a wow. couple of incidences in life where I say, if I wasn't alive, you know, how would I? How would God be allowed to do His work? Because it's not always God just performing this magic miracle where the clouds open up and the angels come down. Sometimes we are the angel, you know, but we have to be receptive, mm-hmm. you know, and He uses us as His instruments. You know, another time. I had a kitchen accident. I was on parole washing dishes at this old restaurant called Rosalie's. It was on De La Montagne. Rosalie's, that sounds Yeah, funny. I was on parole, and they made me uh, get a job washing dishes, and I felt really beneath myself. And I didn't like the job. And I warned the guy like three times. I said, at 12 o'clock, please stop using dishes. I said, if you need to use a pan, use one to cook for yourself because the kitchen's supposed to be closed. I got to get back to park extension to the halfway house by 2 o'clock. The guy didn't listen to me. I was about to punch him in the head. And at the last second, I saw the fear in his eyes, and I said, if I punch him, I'm going back to jail. So I, I, I punched through the ceramic, the plywood, the jeep rock, everything in the wall of the kitchen. My hand came out, was peeled open like a banana. I still got all the scars here. They had to sew back my two fingers. They were severed. 
And I said, oh, fuck, there goes my training. And I saw that the, the, the right away, the Italian guy, uh, his father owned the place. Uh, his father is doing life in jail, and he's the one that got me the job. They said, Leslie is family here. Shut down the cameras. Everybody go, well, goes home. Nobody saw nothing. So they said it was a kitchen accident. So thank God. They, they, they took me to the hospital. They sewed me up and all that. I got stitches, and I was on CSST for the next year. So I made it through my parole. So for me, it was like a blessing because right. I, at that time, I couldn't hold down a job. I never really worked long in my life. Right. So for me, I know nobody wants to sever their fingers, but for me, I'd rather sever my fingers than hold down a job. Right, right, right. So anyways... Uh, um, I had to go to physio at the Montreal General one day, and, I'm, and it was my mother's retirement day. Uh, I went to say hello to her. It was pouring rain. I was walking up the hill to the Montreal General, and I, and I, I say in Polish, I go, Tata, just take me out of here. Like, I didn't want to live anymore. Like I said, like, I, I couldn't train. I was, I, I was feeling down on myself. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's pouring rain, and I see this orderly waiting at the tarpaulin at the emergency of the general. And this taxi pulls up with an old lady and an old man. And just when I said in Polish, Tata, which is father, I said, take me out of here. It stops raining on me. It's like a dome of light right over me. Like the rain wasn't touching me anymore. And the guy just fell into my arms as he was falling to the ground, smashed, passing out. I had him in my arms. I picked him up and I carried him over to the orderly and put him in the chair. And the guy was like freaking out at what he just saw. He thought for sure this guy was smashing the ground. And me, I just popped up out of nowhere and got the mad from falling on the ground. And the wife said, thank God you were there. So I, I, I got shivers right now telling the story. So mm. I walked in to the emergency, uh, to the doctor where I'm supposed to do the physio. After I go, all right, Lord. I said, I'm not here for me. I'm here for them. Right. So, I mean, because I, I was a guy who kind of wished for death a lot in his life, too. You know, you say, how can somebody be crazy enough to do a lot of the crazy things I did? I'm a guy who, I don't know. I just uh, had a hard life. I always believed in God. Never stopped. But uh, I didn't like what I was doing, and uh, I, I paid for it any way I could. And I always tried to do good for people when I was around, as long as I was around, right to the end. I never abandoned So uh, I guess he had a purpose for me that day, and that's just some of the, the things he's done. You know, I mean, the, a lot of people, they were addicted to drugs. They were stuck up in gangs inside. And I said, listen, I'll teach you the gym and I'll, I'll help you train, but I don't want you hanging around with gangs anymore because mm -hmm. they're going to make you stab people and you're going to end up getting life in here. A lot of people, they come to jail with a little sentence. They end up doing life because they start stabbing people in jail and killing them, and then you're going to end up getting more time. Right. So, I mean, I mentored a lot of people along the way too. So I, I believe that even through my bad things, there was good that came out of it. Maybe absolutely. not for me, but for other people. <laughs> no, I think even for you, absolutely. I have trouble seeing it sometimes, but then again, so, I'm living in me. Yeah. But he sees everything, so I'll let him count my blessings. Yes. So you get out of prison. You um, are not robbing banks anymore. Um, you're coming out. Now, what, like, what's, what are you doing now? Right now, I've been doing landscaping, snow removal, uh, Training a person here and there. I'm not organized. I'm all over the place. And it's you were saying it's it's hard, obviously, now to get a job in certain areas. Yeah, because of like your I mean, criminal. I've been offered some nice jobs, and I can't take them because I'm not bondable. Well, when is your criminal record cleared? At a point, it's going to. I'd have to cleared. apply for a pardon. I don't think it's ever going to get cleared. But why don't why don't you apply for a pardon? Well, I mean, you can only apply for a pardon seven years after your mandate. Okay, so soon. My mandate was November 26, 2019. So, I mean, okay, you got to add seven so, years to that. Okay, so... That's but I don't really want to work for anybody. I just want to train people and work for, for sure, myself. For I don't, sure, but I think to get I just, it so uh, that I don't think holding down... A, uh, look, if you have a family, you got a wife and kids, I understand, means to an end. Everybody's got to yeah. do, do a job sometimes they're not happy with. But there comes a point in your life where you say, I need to start doing something I love to do that's yeah. not considered work yeah. in order to keep doing it or I can't keep going on like and this. And for you, it's fitness. No, yeah. Like it's I love, I love the gym. Motivating. The gym, God and the gym saved my life. You know, I've always been in the gym. I love it. I need to do it. Uh, I've had doctors tell me not to do it because I mean, I had a, I had a I snapped four tendons in my shoulder, and uh, and uh, the six doctors told me they can't do the surgery, and I wasn't going to get it. And I prayed and I prayed, and finally the seventh doctor said, "I see how important it is to you, and I'll take the risk, but you're going to have to sign the paper that if anything goes wrong, it's on you. You'll have no shoulder left." Mm -hmm. So I prayed to God. I give it to God, and. Uh, Dr. Mark Berman did my shoulder, and that's the best orthopedic surgeon I've ever met in my life. 
to me, a lot of these doctors today are cowards. Sorry to say, they're cowards because they they don't want to take a high risk uh, operation because it might make their portfolio look bad. Mm-hmm. Hey, if it means so much to you, do the operation, make the guy sign the paper, do the surgery. You're a doctor. You're supposed to love to open people up. You know, that's your job. Mm-hmm. So you're doing it for the reputation and the money. That's all you're doing it for. So to me, I don't have any respect for you. But this guy, Dr. Mark Berman, he was special. And he even said he doesn't, he couldn't believe that he got the fourth tendon bolted into my shoulder back because it was already two years after the injury. I was in jail when it happened. Wow. So I was living with one tendon holding my whole shoulder together. Wow. Six doctors, told, six specialists told me, you'll never train again and you can't train anymore. And I, I said, was God. I was God. That was God. It was God. And it was Dr. Mark Burman because he took the chance on me. Right. You know, the, I, I found the doctor that the universe gave me yeah. to take a chance on a guy like me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, do you ever feel like God is kind of like always guiding you into the right direction? And deep down, you know. I feel God is guiding, but I also feel the devil plays with the mind a lot. Because Definitely. you see so much. Like, see. A child, when a child looks at the world, he doesn't know sometimes when he's a little baby, what's the tree, what's the sun, what's the birds. He's just looking in awe. Mm -hmm. There's no mental labeling. So that's why Jesus said, if you do not, if you do not enter the kingdom like that of a child, you will not see it at all. So a lot of these priests do not see the kingdom because they're all like, oh, I'm a bishop, I'm a pope, I'm this, I'm that. No, you're nothing. You're everything, but you're nothing at the same time. Because the more ego you got, the further you are from God. Sorry to say, that's the way it is. So just because you're an archbishop, maybe he's, you're a beautiful archbishop, maybe God appointed you everything. But who are you beneath that? Who are you? Are you working from the Spirit? Then if you are, then you have the Holy Spirit. If you are not, then you are not with Him. You serve the other guy. I think ego is the true... Demise of it's, humanity. It's it's one of the things that... It drives us forward, but can demolish us at the same time. Yeah. But apparently, as it burns, your light increases. Why are the most spiritual people the ones that have the hardest pasts? The Polish Pope, I think he saw his, his sister or something get shot by the Nazis. That's when he gave himself over to the order, you know, and became uh, who he was. Why do you think? The pain. I think that pain sometimes is what transmutes into, into light. Mm-hmm. Some, like Mother Teresa. Like, it, what, what, nobody talks about her, but man, that lady really did something noble. She helped people that nobody wants to know. Nobody wants to talk to lepers. Nobody wants to do that. But she felt like that was her calling, you know, because she, apparently she was going to just stay in the order. And she was flying over Calcutta in a plane. And she said that the Holy Spirit talked to her and says, please go and represent me there. I, they do not know me. So she listened. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't the order, the Vatican that sent her there. She was sent from divine inspiration, wow. you know. Yeah. Why do I know these things? I don't even know why I know these things. And I don't even go on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, yeah, a lot of spiritual people really had a lot of suffering in their life. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of religious people, but it doesn't mean they're saved. And it doesn't... Look, there's people that go to church that are not saved. There are people that go to church that are saved. But who are you when you walk in and walk out? Do you walk the walk or you do not? It's simple as that. And nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. The Lord knows how many hairs are on your head. You know, I don't, you don't. So, I mean, there is an all-knowing being that knows us, you know, and he knows our hearts. And he knows when you're a good person, when you're a bad person. Do you believe everything happens for a reason? I believe that everything ultimately happens for a reason. Sometimes, relatively, they say there's these uh, mistakes or this and that, but sometimes there's a lesson in there, but we don't see it at the time. We might see it in, in yeah. retrospection. Once you meet somebody and you go, I don't know why that happened. But then all of a sudden, a year later, it's bang, yeah. you're, you bump into that person again. You're like, oh my God, that's why. I have this. It dis- comes to you like in that flash. Yeah, I have this discussion with a lot of people, and I always ask them like if they believe everything happens for a reason or if they believe like they have... Like, they choose their own path because... Look, the, uh, I'll just say this. There was this woman I really, 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 really cared about a lot recently. And I did everything I could to get her off drugs and get her off the street. And I did everything I could. And she just stayed on the drugs. She lost her kids to the DPG. She's not even allowed to see her kids right now unless she's supervised by somebody. She lives on the street. And she was telling me how bad her ex-boyfriend is and this and that. And now she's on the street somewhere and the guy's probably pimping her or whatever. And... 
I had to let her go. I feel like I failed. I feel like I, I put myself in debt trying to help her out and everything, and she took it all for granted. I tried to take her up north and dry her out when I was uh, delogging a forest, you know, and, and uh, she knows I'm a good guy, and she saw, like, she tried. I, I, saw, I saw her do 30 days of sobriety in front of my eyes. So I know I saw the good in her, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of bad. There's a lot of bad. She'll lie to me. She'll, she'll. But you have to understand that that's not on I you. I felt like though. I failed. I, I felt know, like I failed, I, I and I prayed about like her. I lit failed. candles for her in church. I did everything I could possibly do for her, and but I lost her. But you didn't her. fail. You did what you can. But well, then I failed me because I you feel like everything you. I did is for nothing. But you're gonna say one day I'm gonna say maybe she'll clean up in a year from now, or whatever. I think sometimes things don't make sense at the moment, but they will in. But time. I know that if she doesn't clean but up soon in a year, she could be dead. Her, like she's a very pretty woman, yes. but her kidneys are going. Yes, I know intuitively know, that her kidneys are going. But you have to know that you did what you can. You did everything you can. No, to I wasn't her. able to cure her. I know, and I that, need the Holy Spirit to give me that power. But that's not on you. You did what you can, and whatever's left. I've been praying a lot on this one lately. So I mean, you're but, telling me, and I believe you, but I'm saying that this has been haunting me in the night. I worry about her. She's out there. She's out the there. The thing she is, never it's like we nothing. can do everything that's in our control, but afterwards, like we have to also think about ourselves in the sense of like, okay, I did what I can. Now it's not up to me anymore. I did everything I could. But that's what I did, and I still and, and feel like why. I felt maybe I'm a perfectionist like you. Maybe I, I feel like I have a, a, a an X on my on my uh, r report. An X. Uh, oh boy, <laughs> I feel like I have How an X ironic. on my, my. I have this little paper with God, and it says, "Okay, he did this check mark, check mark, check no. mark," and I have an X here God because I failed that her. Way. I failed no, her. you didn't fail her. If I had more money, I could have taken her off the street, move her up north, put a roof over her no. head permanently, and I couldn't. I don't have that kind of money anymore. I'm not a criminal. The thing is, you didn't fail her. That is her life. At the end of the day, and you did everything you can. At the end of the day, you could only fail yourself. You can't I did everything I could do, you did everything but Satan you could. was very strong in this case. Satan was very strong because right. Satan makes her stay on the street. But Satan, because so, you're going to say, oh, she's got a choice. No, Satan got her with that addiction. Mm -hmm. She is so heartbroken about losing her kids that that justifies the ego and the addiction to keep propelling the insanity mm -hmm. to keep using every day and not clean up, get your kids back, get an apartment, get steady, do something good. And I said, when I leave your life, you're going to fall hard because you, you, there, there's nobody that's going to care for you the way I did. I, I didn't want to go out with her. She hit on me even. Like I said, I just want to help you. I want to make sure you're safe. I don't want anybody to rape you or whatever on the street and this yeah. and that. But she's very street savvy. Like they say sometimes you could take the person off the street, but you can't, you can't take, take the, the street, street out of the person. Out of the person. She, I don't know if she played me or if she really cared about me. I, I, I want to hope that there was a good part of her that cared. But in the I end, she the didn't end, want to listen to me, and she had to be her own boss. And But I think in the end, like, you're a great person. I literally and kicked down drug dealers' doors when she would go over there to say that she was in the going to the building to do laundry. And I kicked the guy's door down, and I tell them, don't give her any fucking drugs. And then she would yell at me, you're embarrassing me in front of my friends and this and that. I said, you're embarrassing yourself by hanging around with these fucking losers. Mm -hmm. And they're all rats, too, because the cops know damn well there's a dealer here, and they don't arrest him, so he's a fucking rat. Mm -hmm. Sorry to say, I'm sorry. No, 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 a, no, but I, think, I shouldn't call these people rats, but the rats. Yeah, I, I think, call a duck a duck. Yeah, I think honestly, <laughs> you are such a great person, and I feel like you want to do so. Like you want to. Yeah, do but good I do fail. Everyone. I do fail. I'm you not don't perfect. fail. I think, but nobody's perfect, and your failures are. They're, they're not failures. They're lessons. So always remember that. If she doesn't that. get off the street in a year, she might be dead. But that's not on you. And I think that's your hardest part is you yeah, take everything. Yeah, I can walk in and burn down like, the whole building she's in, but I won't do that because then I'll go back to jail. But also I feel like people learn through the lessons and things they need to go through. And if her lesson is that and Come that's on, her story. Come on, how much can you do the same lesson? You lost your two kids. Your kids. They're little kids, and, man. And you did what you could, but I think after a certain point, you have to think of yourself too. That's the hard part. That's my the hard part. Me that, and that's the hard part. That's the hard Where part. Where thinking of myself, I was the guy who never thought of himself, thought of everyone else first, then thought of myself afterwards. Like, okay, I, I can buy another car now. Oh, she's okay. Okay, she got everything was close. Kids got uh, homework, school books, mm -hmm. you know, clothes for school. Everything's How can okay. you save someone from swimming if you're drowning? So you always have to, in the end, be good first. 
and then you can help people. So I think you did what you could, and now it's time for you to swim away and just like heal there's a bit fully of, yourself. There's a bit of old me that would have handled it in a much more, uh, let's just say, assertive way. That I have to fight my ego from my past to not, and I had to let it go. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really like I'm talking to you about it today. Yeah, I shouldn't talk about it, but it breaks my heart because I really cared for her as a human being, mm -hmm. and especially as a mother. And it's really hard to and see those poor someone, kids. And it's really hard to see someone you love going through something, especially when you understand yeah, but I think it. I loved her. I don't think she loved. Me. If she loved me, she would listen to me. I she mean, I think that I I don't. I, it's okay. You can leave it. I don't think she didn't love you. I think the addiction got over her and you of all people so the like, love was not strong enough mm, i don't know you just said it the devil the devil loves the, to divide god yeah. unites us together i don't think it's that divides. she didn't love you i don't think that i don't think it's that she, she did didn't love you i think me. she wasn't respecting me in the end every time every time i talk but it's like i was talking to is air. it are you talking to her or are you talking to the addiction talking to the addiction so you can't take it personal like but you said it's I the was devil asking for god to come in and do his work Right, but I prayed for her. But sometimes God won't give you something you want because it's not in His cards for you. Or the person that's possessed is not asking. Like you, like being... I'm asking that here. Like, it, 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 like she said, she prays. I said, then if you pray, you know what you need to do. You know, you need to get away from these bad people. You know, like once you're clean and sober for like six months a year, and you got a lot of power behind you, you can walk through the lions then and be able to say no. But right now, you got to get away from everybody you knew and everything you knew. Mm -hmm. And that, she's too comfortable. There's too many enablers. She's a pretty girl. Somebody's going to give her a roof over her head. Somebody's going to go buy her drugs. You know, that's the way it goes. Nothing I can do about it. I just think there's there's always situations in life where you really want something and you're like, God, like, like, like I let me help her. Like, let me save her. And it doesn't happen. And no matter how much you pray, it's because it's not in the cards for you. And it's not in the cards. It's not in the cards. And you could get angry about it. But, like, if you believe in God, you believe that there's a plan and there's a reason why he, th that's not happening right now. And, like I said, Well, maybe my ego was too involved. Maybe I, I it was, maybe, you know, I, I wanted something that she's not ready for. Maybe in five exactly. years from now she'll be ready. Or exactly. maybe, so, maybe she'll never be ready. Maybe she'll be dead. For sure. But the lesson here is that for you, you can't take it personal because it's not on you. I take it to heart. You take it to heart. And I, I get that because... You obviously have so much love and, and care for her. But I don't even know why. I wasn't looking for it there. I don't know why I cared about her so much. I just went to a building where my my friend's mother said before she died, please look after my son. You're the only good friend he ever had. He's an alcoholic. I went into the building. And I said, this woman doesn't belong here. I mean, she actually looks clean. She looks like normal. And uh, and I just, I just couldn't let it go. I said, are you okay? Do you have a place to stay? Or, you know, like... And it just uh, didn't matter what she looks on the outside. She's really addicted. She's really addicted to drugs, more than she can look. Some people they pull it off well. The, the remember, addiction and the devil are very good. They know how to hide themselves very, very well. Mm -hmm. She knows how to disguise it, make it look like she's in control. She's not in control. Mm -hmm. The addiction is in control. Yeah, you're never in control when you're addicted. Don't to tell something. me you can sell your body and not be an addict to something. You're either addicted to money, drugs, or something. Don't tell me that because there's no way you can look in the mirror with yourself and say you're proud of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me that. Then you're a liar. Yeah. Well, Leslie, um, the cameras are dying. Sorry to and talk on a negative. No, no, no. Let's no. leave off on a positive. No, no, no. <laughs> we are leaving off on a positive. Um, is there any last things you'd like to say to anyone listening? Um, who knows? Maybe you'll get some clients for private training. That'd be nice. Yeah. Maybe you'll bring me back on the show one day. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll for sure. We'll shoot things. the shits again, for sure. We'll yeah. do like a part two. Well, Leslie, I want to say thank you so much for coming You're on. You're welcome. My pleasure. Um, this has been so different than any episode I've ever done. Yeah. And do you think there's anything truly like this out there or no? Uh, I think there's one guy who got out of prison and it was... And, and did a podcast. Yeah, but a lot of them are all informants today. I see them. For sure. The big ones on YouTube are all informants, and I. It's hard to respect the guy who never took accountability for yeah. any of his actions. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I don't know. No, definitely. There's even if there is something out there, it's nothing like this. So I want to say it once again. Thank you so much for coming on. So welcome. Um, I'll probably have you back on. This was so cool, so different for me, and I feel like I learned a lot. So thank you so much for You're coming welcome. on. You're welcome. Woo! That's a wrap! Thank you. You're welcome. The X you keep going.